never to leave the shed, sister. Hello, Mike. Film brain? You're not my sister. What are you doing here? I was in the neighbourhood and felt like a cup of tea, so I decided to break into your house and make a brew, as British people are wont to do. Of course, but I could have sworn we've met before. No? No, I don't think so. No, 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 I think we did. Although it could have been a dream where you and I kissed on the lip. Okay, thank you, that's enough. Say, how much would you like to do a crossover? If I wanted to do a crossover with you, I've still got that bloody puppet as a back scratcher. Oh, come on, it'll be fun. Say, how much do you like Eddie Murphy in fat suit? Not very. Excellent. This way. Shameful sequel beatdown. And I'm a British person. You can't say that. It sounds weird. It's my sign on. But we're both British people. You're British? With that accent? I thought you were Australian. Oh, <laughs> joke about my voice. That's clever and mature. But can I go for another one? Just don't say anything. Hello and welcome to a shameful sequel beatdown. And we're British people. Close enough. And we're going for an extra helping of horrible with Nutty Professor 2, The Clumps. The remake of The Nutty Professor was a very funny movie, and it marked the return to form for Eddie Murphy for both audiences and critics, which then led into a lot of crappy family movies, but that's beside the point. What the film didn't need in the slightest was a sequel, because it was all wrapped up in the first movie. Sherman defeated his brash, slim, egotistical alter ego, Buddy Love, proved his worth and got the girl. But because it was such a huge box office smash hit, it earned a sequel anyway, and the results are just as pointless as you could imagine. Two of the major comedic scenes in the first film involved Sherman's family, the clumps, all played by Murphy in varying degrees of makeup, and became something of a surprise sensation, especially considering that these scenes were very nearly dropped from the film. It wasn't the first time Murphy's done the whole multiple role shtick. It starts in Coming to America, but he also did it in Vampire in Brooklyn, Bowfinger, Pluto Nash, Meet Dave, and Norbit. But the clumps were so successful that the sequels intend to expand their roles as noted by the sequel subtitle. Well, that's the idea anyway. In execution, not so much. With Peter Sagal taking over directing duties, the film is the product of four credited writers, two of which are the Whites brothers fresh off their own hit American Pie, which certainly explains some of the content. Eddie Murphy in a terrible film is bad enough. But imagine him to the power of eight. We don't need to imagine. We have the theatrical cut of Nutty Professor to the Clumps to show that super size isn't always a good thing. So the film begins with a wedding scene, which also serves as a way of reintroducing Eddie Murphy as each member of the Clump family by already making it feel like they're forcing them down our throat in the first two minutes. You see, Sherman is getting married to... Who the heck is this? Professor Sherman Clump and his longtime sweetheart, Denise Gaines. Surprise! Great! A boner gag, four minutes in. I always thought Eddie Murphy was a bit of a dickhead. Boom! Shh. In the last film, the subtext was that Buddy was meant to represent Sherman's repressed sexuality. You know, being a shy virgin and all. But screw that for the sequel! We'll just have him literally be a massive erection, because no one could possibly miss that! Buddy starts coming out of Sherman's asshole with terrible CGI effects, and we get a nut shot too, because we're clearly setting our sights really freaking low right now. Buddy steals the bride, but don't worry, it was just a dream being recounted to Dr. Silberman from The Terminator. No wonder his symptoms are getting worse. All these diplomas on this wall don't make up for the fact that you got a little Vienna sausage in your drawers. Shut up, fat ass! <laughs> wow, that's professional. You'd think a trained psychologist would have thicker skin than that. And why are all the jokes so far about dicks and asses? Either Sherman's repressing something else or 
The filmmakers really need to look above the waist. Well, not like boobs. <laughs> Tips. The doctor tells Sherman he just needs to be confident to overcome Buddy, but his alter ego puts up a good fight. Kinda hot today, huh, Professor? Hot, nice and hot! Oh, Professor, I loved your lecture the other day. How the hell did she not hear that? He practically shouted that at the top of his lungs. Was she deaf? In fact, how did she not see him when she turned around? Even if she didn't see or hear that, it's a crowded university campus. Or is sexual harassment a regular thing there? And now we come to the most unbelievable thing in this movie. Janet Jackson's Denise is actually meant to be a professor specialising in genetics. Excuse me. When that day is <laughs> <the day. laughs> Oh, my eye! Ah, oh, Professor Clum. Seriously, even Denise Richards was a more plausible scientist than this woman. And she walked around in a tank top and shorts. And why does Sherman try to push in and find a seat when surely a man of his size would have the common sense to just stand and watch it from the back? Oh, that's right. So I can make mean-spirited fat jokes about him, of course. Sherman has something to show both Denise and Dean Richmond, played once again by Larry Miller. Last movie's MacGuffin was a weight loss formula. This time... This is Bust. Buster suffers from an advanced agent. If I have composed this formula properly, this should be most impressive. Ah, you've just discovered the, the fountain of youth. I know this is fantasy, but at least weight loss was semi-plausible, and it didn't make Sherman look like some kind of god. And maybe I'm overthinking this for a comedy, but does this mean Sherman's essentially cured death? Because that could have grave repercussions for the whole of mankind! That night, the clumps go out for a bite to eat at an all-you-can-eat buffet, where they literally wipe clean anything and everything all but the salad. We get it, you're fat. This restaurant scene is meant to expand upon the dinner scenes in the first because we've relocated to a restaurant, but they don't do anything new with the setting. Well, except for Ernie Jr. eating straight from the ice cream machine, which is less how embarrassing is this family and more. Laugh at the fatties, they eat a lot, those pigs. Worse, even their banter is uninspired compared to the first. I got a razor in this bag. There ain't even no bag you got in your hand, that's your titty. Who that piece of biscuit remind you of? <gasps> Mr. Johnson? Instead of the fun banter from the first, we get this. A bunch of droopy tit and flaccid willy jokes. It's enough to put anyone off their dinner. And whilst the sequence is impressive technically, the problem with doing it so well is that we end up taking those effects for granted, and once you get past that, you realise the sequence isn't actually all that funny. And if you're praising them for a strength with the fart jokes at least, that's only because they're saving that for the scene's climax. Hang on, is that Chris Elliott in a 10 second minor role? When I mean, you're gonna stop jabbing and tell everybody you got laid off. <laughs> Great. Exploding flatulence. That scene was a complete waste of time and did absolutely nothing for the story. Well, so were the scenes in the original. That's why they got cut. The only reason that you're saying that is because this scene wasn't as fun as it was the first time around, and because that you just find yourself asking the filmmakers, for goodness sake, put me out of my misery and get on with it! And so begins one of the worst parts of this movie, an impotency subplot about Cletus, Sherman's father, who's having trouble with his libido, which is made worse by the fact that Granny's getting it on next door, because old people having sex is inherently funny. Why did they feel the need to include a subplot like this? If you wanted more scenes with the clumps, do you really think a half-serious scene about erectile dysfunction is the answer? It's pointless. And it's made worse when you realise that when it comes down to it, it's all about Eddie Murphy trying to fuck himself. And that's something I really don't need to think about. Take a look at this reading I'm getting. Right there. But it look. It's always helpful to find an evil gene when it actually laughs on a computer simulation. So even though he overcame Buddy last time, you wouldn't have a sequel out him popping up, and Sherman wants to extract the gene. Since when was Buddy a gene? Wasn't he a testosterone-induced side effect of the weight loss formula? But then the movie goes to a sad bit where Denise gives him some news. Well, I've been offered a full professorship at the University of Maine. There's something very important to me here, and... I'm not so sure I can just leave it behind. Sherman, you're very special to me. You're very special to me? Glad to hear it, but you're certainly not to us. 
Where the hell is Jada Pinkett anyway? You know, this would make more sense if she was a graduate student like Carla was in the original. Did they literally just hit the find and replace function for all the times she was mentioned in the original script? The attempts at compassion for Sherman just ring false this time around because it's clear the film doesn't really believe in him in the same way the remake did, but instead sees him as the butt of easy weight jokes. To excuse the pun, the movie has its cake and eats it. Worse, it just adds to the running time because the whole main thing gets dispensed with very quickly anyway and the movie just could have got rid of it and not lost a thing. Sherman tries to propose to Denise, but things go wrong when he has another buddy attack. Denise, where are you? Hey, Sherman! Where you? Put my beef in your taco! No! Put on the glass! Am I watching a sequel to The Nutty Professor or American Pie? Well, Eddie Murphy is shagging the ground like an apple pie in the desperate attempt for a laugh, so... There's not much difference between them, really. Since we're following the exact same plot beats, substituting Reggie's humiliation for buddies, Sherman once again turns himself into a guinea pig by using Denise's gene targeting research to extract Buddy out of his own DNA. Is that blue liquid stuff meant to be Buddy? Is that what happens when you extract DNA? Mm, I don't know, but if you try to extract all traces of Buddy from your system like that, not only is it impossible, but it would down well kill you! With Buddy all out of his system, Sherman makes another attempt to propose to Denise, a somewhat unique one involving spraying a pheromone to attract some fireflies to write a message in the sky. How does that work? Because that's certainly not what Aerosol does. It would disperse in the air and the message would be all goldygook. Sherman, you really hurt my feelings and show an ugly side to yourself that you've never shown before. Oh, you proposed? I love you forever and forever! <laughs> But Sherman may not be rid of his rival after all, since Buster the Research Dog ends up knocking over the beaker of Buddy DNA, which in combination with electricity and one of Buster's hairs reforms into a separate person. Call me crazy, but I'm not sure that's how science actually works. And if he's reforming himself by attaching to a dog hair, then surely he would become some sort of hideous half-man, half-dog hybrid, as opposed to a mostly human Eddie Murphy? But regardless, things seem to be looking up for Sherman and Denise, including news that a major pharmaceutical company has made a preemptive offer for the youth formula to the tune of $150 million, which seems a little low considering it's a miracle, but never mind. They decide to go to the cinema to see Cape Fear, which is also parodied in this scene as this is where they first encounter the newly reformed Buddy Love. Buddy Love, we used to both chase that girl Carla at the same time. Mm -hmm. You ever hit that? Miss Purdy and I were just friends. I guess that means you didn't hit it, huh? How do we get to talk about Jada Pinkett? Oh yes. Way to piss on the ending of the last movie, but I'm plotting their relationship didn't go any further than just friends, for the sake of introducing a new, but suspiciously similar character. Why did they even need to introduce a new character to begin with? I mean, if Jada Pinkett was so busy, they could have at least recast her part. Yeah. And if Sherman was so lovelorn about this long-lost love from the past, why has he never mentioned her before? Buddy wants a piece of the youth formula, especially when he pickpockets Sherman and learns of the huge offer. So while Sherman hides the formula and discovers how Buddy was created, shouldn't he have learnt about it first thing this morning? Did nobody notice this huge blue puddle until just now? Buddy makes a rival bid selling his own formula, which requires him to steal Sherman's. Shouldn't he share Sherman's knowledge if we're going with this. Also, he's developed dog characteristics, which mostly exist so he can get turned on by photos of dogs, and a really dumb scene where he pisses on a toilet floor rather than using the urinals next to him. Because dogs lay down paper themselves? Apparently not content with just remaking The Nutty Professor, Eddie Murphy decides to throw bits of the shaggy dog in there as well. Take that, Tim Allen! Evidently he's been spending far too much time on the set of Doctor Doolittle. He's getting into bestiality! Buddy isn't the only one suffering side effects, as Sherman finds himself getting dumber. When you extracted Buddy, somehow it altered the gene that regulates neurotransmitter activity to the cerebral cortex. You're losing your intelligence. How does extracting a gene make you dumber? Those are two entirely different parts of the body! Shouldn't he be developing cancer or something? Then again, anybody who's been watching the film so far can certainly empathise with Sherman's plight. Sherman discovers his place has been completely trashed by Buddy looking for the formula, but it's still safe. Despite the fact that he shouldn't even need to move it at all, because the plot says so, Sherman moves the formula to the fridge in the garage of the clump house, not even conceding it like he did before, and laying slip to his father what it is. I know Sherman's getting dumber, but really? 
when Cletus discovers his wife and mother-in-law have been gabbing about his sex problems, oh hi Wonder Sykes, he decides to use the youth potion on himself, and it works. It makes him young again. Well, younger, really, not young young. Thus he decides to hit the clubs. Is 1970s disco a popular theme these days? You got the finest looking thing I've seen in a long time. A lot of young men are intimidated by an older woman. Young? He's bloody 40 odd himself. And there's hardly anything to be intimidated by. He's hardly robbing the cradle. And I guess Sherman threw in a bit of that weight loss solution in there too whilst he's at it since Cletus lost weight. Because you can possibly be young and fat. That only happens to old people. Speaking of old people, Cletus gets into a fight with a fellow suitor of the woman at the bar who beats the crap out of him because it's funny when scrawny elderly people do karate kid poses. At the same time this is happening, Buddy is going to meet up with the pharmaceutical executive but she gets tired of waiting and decides to stick with Sherman. Luckily for Buddy, this is the exact same alley that Cletus is getting beaten up in when the formula wears off, indicating that it's being hidden at the clump house. Seriously, what a massive coincidence. Are you telling me that in this enormous city, with endless bars and restaurants, that they happen to be in the same place at the same bloody time? And remember, if Sherman didn't move the formula, then none of this would have happened. That's a lot of awkward plotting just to keep the story moving. This also leads into a scene where Cletus tries to seduce his wife by taking the youth formula again, but Mama Clump freaks out over it, claiming some nonsense about how he doesn't like her for who she is. Again, why are these scenes in the movie? I mean... They could be funny, but it doesn't actually feel like they're playing these scenes for laughs. Maybe she didn't want to take the youth formula because, as good as the makeup is, they just couldn't make Eddie Murphy look like a young, attractive woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's a laugh right there. Ooh, that's it. <laughs> Elsewhere, Denise takes Sherman to see her parents. Wait, they're engaged and he still hasn't met them yet. And the joke is that they're both rocket scientists and Sherman's not a genius, he's being a stupid head. Wait, Janet Jackson is the product of two rocket scientists. Oh gee, an old parrot. I wonder if that will in any way come into play in this hideously laboured scene just like Sherman's open fly. Why don't you give us a little preview of the speech you're going to make at the press conference? This piece of corn here can represent a strand of DNA. These niblets represent each gene. What we're attempting to do here is to extract the bad, bad genes. Ah, crackers! Oh, he KO'd a bird and yanked everything off the table. What a shock. The humour is slapstick, but it's predictable and not funny. And even if Sherman's not a genius, surely his IQ loss would mean he's only that of a normal person. Just because he's not as smart as he once was, doesn't mean he suddenly becomes a rude asshole with no tact whatsoever. Maybe Eddie Murphy just thinks that's what his audience is like. Sherman, you were acting really strange tonight. I had cold medicine early on and mixing cold medicine and wine, that, that don't mix, you know. I'm really worried about you. I really think you should get a checkup. If he knows what's happening, then why doesn't he just tell her? She's a scientist. She could probably help. Ah, but if we've learned anything for romantic comedies, it's that keeping secrets is always the basis of a strong relationship. Oh, he's stock footage of Eddie Murphy as Lance Perkins. That doesn't count as an extra performance, thank you. Do you remember the dream sequence from the first movie? Well, good, because we're doing it even bigger this time as a parody of sci-fi flicks, especially Armageddon. Sherman, you've got to blow up the asteroid. Um, Creature! Sherman, I am your father. Use your force, Sherman. <laughs> dream sequence an already weak bit needed? More fart jokes again and again. References to Armageddon, Star Wars, 2001. Has this become to boldly flee? Oh, that's a low blow, man. My god, he didn't plant those charges on the asteroid. Oh, no, I done blowed up the wrong one. How Plant the bomb on the moon without anyone noticing he wasn't on the asteroid? Hey, why are you pointing out the internal inconsistencies of a bloody dream sequence? Of course he's not going to make sense, he's getting dumber. Sorry, I just like to review things, you know? Makes me feel better. The following night at the Clumps house, they throw a bachelorette party for Denise. Yeah, hey, that's a little special present for your wedding night. Oh, <laughs> mama! Maybe something I wouldn't have chosen for myself, but <laughs> thank you. As opposed to the outfit you infamously wore at the Super Bowl, eh? 
<laughs> yeah. It's during the party that Buddy sneaks in trying to find the youth potion and Granny confuses him with a stripper that she's ordered and there are several scenes that just waste time with her flirting with him. Thanks to Granny, Buddy discovers the youth formula in the fridge and steals some of it, cutting the rest with fertilizer, laughing like he knows what that will do. How the hell does he know that? I don't know when they turned Granny into a sex addict, but I really don't like it. Especially when they had several awful fantasy sequences with her bouncing boobs and making love to him. Ew, no, don't show that. Before going out to try and seduce him in the garage, which means she somehow managed not to see the actual strippers arrived and he's doing his act in the living room. Oh, can not. Ugh, <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, look at that. Some poor bugger had to digitise saliva going from Eddie Murphy kissing himself. And I know the gag is, ew, old people and sex are icky, but that's because the filmmakers haven't quite realised that Buddy is made of the DNA of her grandson. So isn't this technically incest? No wonder he's throwing up. Stop trying to fuck yourself, Eddie Murphy! Yeah. So now it's the day of the press conference to show off the youth formula, with Sherman still unaware of Buddy's tampering, testing it on hamsters. In fact, it turns one from being real into CGI. That's good formula. But then the fertiliser kicks in and it's suddenly turned into Godzilla hamster. Just because it's huge doesn't mean it'll suddenly turn evil. And then it turns doing projectile shitting, because that's apparently what normal-sized hamsters do a lot. I'd seriously love to know what the hell was going on when the writing team cooked this crap up. I'm guessing this is meant to top the hamster siege from the start of the first film, but hundreds of hamsters running amok is absolutely worlds away from whatever the hell this is. And why is the Dean hiding under a fur coat rather than running away like everyone else? To set up this stupidity. Oh no, I'm not that kind of- ah! Mr. Rape? Really? Even my sexual fantasies aren't quite that perverted. I, I mean, how committed as an actor do you have to be to read a script where you get buggered by a giant hamster and go, you know what, let's do this. It's not like have any shame left. Buddy is, of course, there to pick up the pieces and gets another deal with a pharmaceutical company whilst the Dean, recovering surprisingly quickly all things considered, fires Sherman. Is accidentally getting your boss molested by a giant hamster Albeit indirectly, a sackable offence? Um, probably? So after the big hilarious second act set piece, we get the inevitable 10 minute come down of consequences that bogs down every single routine comedy, especially when we did the damn firing plot point in the first one. With his condition worsening, does he tell Denise? Of course not. After the wedding, we can even- That's what I'm talking about, the wedding. Denise, I don't think there's gonna be a wedding. My head's just kinda messed up right now. I made a mistake. I have to live with that. Yes, Sherman, make vague hints at what the problem is and then just cancel the wedding without any explanation. How does he think that will help? Hey, dealing with problems in an introverted way is a man thing. A woman couldn't possibly help with that. Or at least that's the argument of his father since he's also not told his family and they're worried about him too. Also, look out for how the two Murphy parents merge together as they hug. Oh shit, their universe is collapsing. Cletus gives his son a talk. Yeah, I know I sure do love Denise. Well then y'all got to get back together then. Wait a minute, that's it. If we get back together, then that'll make everything okay. I can use the youth formula to make him so young I'll turn him back into goop. I eat it. So the plan is that he's going to eat him? If that's how DNA worked, I'd be half cheeseburger. Sherman cooks up a concentrated batch of the youth formula back on the Wellman campus, which he was fired from. So how the hell did he get access to the computers, let alone break into their science lab? The Dean nurse is in trespassing and thinks he's trying to sell it under a different name, which means he gets dragged along for the ride. I'm guessing a test group somewhere really loved the hell out of Larry Miller. They storm into the building just in time to stop Buddy's demonstration, where Sherman uses Buddy's canine DNA against him by playing catch with him. Stop wasting time already! Buddy catches the ball in his mouth and drinks the concentrate inside, reverting to that of a toddler. Oh shit! Everything's under control! What the hell are you looking at? This is an impressive package for a toddler! Oh no, now it's bloody baby geniuses! And why does the toddler have weird Eddie Murphy voice with awful CGI lip movements? 
Worst dubbing ever. Well, presumably, because if it spoke with the voice of a small child, talking about the size of its penis, that might be considered really quite creepy. Oh, and now a piss joke. That's where we are at this stage. Oh, and then rappelling down a woman's bubes. And delightful they are too. Buddy then turns into a blob that apparently still thinks and speaks. Like he's a bloody liquid metal terminator. He doesn't even shut up when he gets run over by a car, which sends him splatting onto a large arse. And you know what fat people do? Right? God damn. Yet more fart jokes because she can't spell fart without fat. And how is he speaking without lips? And how could she not hear him? He's literally right behind her. Too obvious? Buddy gets trampled by a trainload of passengers before giving one final F you to Sherman by evaporating on the edge of a fountain. Having run out of things for him to do, the Dean just sods off. Nice. Whilst this has been going on, Denise discovers Sherman's true condition, and with the aid of Cletus, because we've got to work the Clump family in there somehow, race to get him. But they arrive at the scene too late for Sherman, and makes this scene far more unintentionally funny than I think they wanted. Given how frankly stupid Sherman has been throughout this film, this really is the ending he deserves, but no, the power of Deus Ex Machina saves him, as a tear from Denise makes the buddy residue roll into the water and disperse him all over it. They force Sherman to drink the water, in Cleus's case nearly trying to drown him, which magically restores his memory and makes everything a-okay. Because that's exactly how science works. Drink the water and it instantly rejoins with your DNA. So, if Buddy is part of Sherman again, does that mean that the split personality attacks are going to resume? It's all about the whole plot of him having to accept Buddy for, you know, a part of him and just shut up and enjoy it. It's his happy ending. Oh. Christ! Calm down. And then we immediately fade to the wedding between Sherman and Denise. Yay! Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. Does that mean he's gonna get hitched up to a hamster? I guess he liked it, really. Ew. Ew. And if you're wondering about the status of Cleus's tackle, yes, he can pitch a tent with it again. I'm sure you all want to know that. And like the first one, the movie concludes with outtakes that are funnier than the actual film, which isn't hard considering the movie's about as funny as being forced to make love to a hamster. So that was Nutty Professor 2, The Clumps. AKA all the fart, sex and fat jokes they couldn't fit in the first one. Thank God. Nutty Professor 2 is the definition of a Hollywood sequel. There's no reason for it to exist other than the first one made a load of money, so let's throw even more money at it and make another. A lot of the film is just made up from sequences from the first one, but bigger, which pushes them well past their breaking point. Its debilitating lack of imagination manifests itself in the frequent grabs at crude humour, and hardly a scene passes without some awful sex joke. The sympathetic charm of the first has long been vacated. Also, the expanded role of the clumps makes the film woefully uneven, as they eat up screen time either doing nothing or in subplots that are tedious. If they intend them to be three-dimensional, as the DVD production notes laughably claims, they failed miserably. Whilst you can admire Eddie Murphy's versatility and the effects that allow him to interact with himself, seeing him in every single scene is exhausting and obnoxious. The film's so thinly spread too, with lots of time wasting across a hundred minutes, and the scenes with Nanny and the giant monster hamster are just awful. Awful, awful, awful. Actually, so is the whole film. I hated it. So, how do we end the review? I mean, it's an Eddie Murphy comedy about him trying to have sex with himself, so... I don't think that's really necessary, do you? <sighs> Alright. Well, I'll fight instead. No, no, no. That's just hypocritical, man. Alright, so what? Do we just sign off? Um, uh, I guess so. <clears throat> I'm Matthew Buck and I'm a British person beating down shameful sequels everywhere you did didn't you a little bit it's all up in my mouth and now uh...